Well, we are very much into Advent. We're singing Christmas carols. We've got the decorations out. I'm not quite there in terms of preaching. Next Sunday, we'll be looking at themes more directly related to Christmas. But today, we are going to stay with Romans chapter 2. And so I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans in your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible with you, but you'd like to follow along, you can certainly grab one. You should be able to find one underneath the row of chairs in front of you. And the page number you want, if you're using that Bible, is 940. It's 940. For the rest of you, Romans chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 17, and I'll read through verse 24. So Paul writes, But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know His will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you are yourself a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast of the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Father God, I ask your blessing upon the preaching of your word today. May your Holy Spirit come, may he be our guide, may he speak to us today through your word. May it be of spiritual benefit to us, I ask. And so we view this as a part of our worship this morning. May we give ourselves over to you and to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember reading years ago a study. And this study was on initials. The, the university, University of California at San Diego, they studied 5,000 death certificates, and they were interested in the initials of the various individuals who had died. Does that make sense? Kind of an odd study, don't you think? Yes, it's odd. The chief researcher uh, shared the results and he said you can have good initials, or you can have bad initials, or you can have neutral initials. So examples of good initials would be ACE, VIP, I mean Victor, what would be the I? You figure it out. Joy, win, or wow. Bad initials included A. Bum, dud, rat, or pig. So that means that if Richard and Becky were to have another daughter, are you planning that? Oh, there you are. <laughs> She's not going to say anything. You would not want to name your baby Peggy Irene Guterres. Because that would, you know, that's big by initials. Neutral initials would be like mine, John Carl Hurdy, J-C-H. Now what was really interesting, these 5,000 initials that were studied, as they tabulated the results, listen to this, the results showed that men with good initials lived an average of 4.48 years, longer than those with neutral initials, and 7.2 years longer, than those with bad initials. And you might think that's just coincidence, but you know, I did know a, a family years ago where the father gave the kids terrible initials and he did it on purpose. 
So there are things in our world that that, that actually can happen. What I want to do, though, with that illustration is use it to, as a springboard to make this statement. From a Jewish perspective, going back to our text, the first words, if you call yourself a Jew, from a Jewish perspective, first century religious Jews felt that they had the best initials of all. Uh, how about what would be S-O-A? Son of Abraham. Or how about S-O-C, Son of the Covenant? In Romans chapter 1, just by way of review, Romans chapter 1, Paul is targeting the irreligious loss. It's the person in the culture who is without Christ and it's just loss. In Romans chapter 2, He's targeting the religious loss. The person who's very religious might be a member of a church, partakes of the various activities of church, but they are lost. They are religious, but they are without Christ. And so the Jews of that first century period Many of them believe that simply because of their Jewishness, that God would spare them. Because they were children of the covenant, that God would spare them. Because they had the right spiritual background, that God would spare them. And so if we're to understand the flow of this text and what Paul is trying to drive home here, he is really challenging some very basic presuppositions from a Jewish perspective of who is God and how does God save people. Now I've divided this sermon into two sections. The first is, and I work part of this, the peril of prideful pedigree. In fact, I'm proud of that effort right there. The peril of prideful pedigree. You know what pedigree means? Well, we know about a pedigree dog, right? An expensive dog, a dog with the right bloodlines. Yeah, dogs are still dogs, that's true. <laughs> but the word can also be used in terms of an individual's understanding of their background. Again, from the Jewish perspective, many of them felt that when the final judgment came, they would be in the box seats. And they would be watching God as he poured out wrath upon the Gentiles. See, simply because of their background, because of their religious inheritance, because God had made special promises to the children of Israel, that that somehow exempted them when final judgment day Arrive. So, you see, they're trusting in something for their salvation, but they're clearly not trusting in Christ. They're trusting in their background. They're trusting in their performance. As I thought about this text this week, I came to this observation. This text by itself would have excluded Paul from the Jewish clergyman of the year award. Because, you see, this... this must have frustrated that original audience. They did not like hearing Paul challenge them in this way. Look at the first words. Paul begins this way. If you call yourself a Jew. If you call yourself a Jew. This last week, I don't know how much attention you paid to it, but it was an interesting week in the history of the United States. Because we observed what's only the 19th national funeral in our nation's history. George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president, passed away. The Bush name is significant in our culture, isn't it? I can remember back in the 90s when he came to Portland... I was living in Portland at that time, and I remember two things primarily. One was that they closed the band field. If 
you're not from Portland, that might seem strange to you, the Banfield. The Banfield is that stretch of Interstate 84 between I-205 and I-5. So it's that stretch that leads you right down to downtown Portland. They closed that for the presidential motorcade. And I remember what a nightmare that created for the city of Portland and all the people trying to, to navigate and to commute and to get where they needed to go. See, the Bush name is significant. It has the power to close a section of an interstate. I also remember that on that trip, President Bush, I don't know if he went to a school or exactly where this happened. I read this in a newspaper. But there was a young man, a young boy, who met the president, and he was somewhat in awe of him, as you might imagine, and he noticed Bush's watch, and he commented on his wristwatch, and Bush took off the wristwatch and gave it to this boy. I hope the boy kept that. Don't you think that would be a great gift to keep? But as I observed pieces of the last week in observing this man's passing and the, the, the funeral service that took place at the National Cathedral, one of the observations that I came to, and I say this sincerely, if your last name was Bush, that means that you're elite. I mean, really elite. The very upper crust of American culture. Don't you think if your last name was Bush that it would be very easy to fall into this way of thinking? You wouldn't say it, you wouldn't articulate this, but nevertheless it would be so easy to begin to think, I'm a Bush, that just means that we are better than other people. We're better than most Americans. Look at our accomplishments. Look where we go to school. We're really, truly elite. And I'm not saying that the Bush family functions that way. I don't know the Bush family. I'm not elite enough to know them. But I'm just simply saying, I think it would be very easy for people who have that kind of power, that kind of privilege to begin to think, truly, we must be better than ordinary. What I can say with certainty is that is precisely how the Jewish people oftentimes in a first century religious context, that's precisely how they thought about themselves. It's not hard really to make some application of this passage to our own lives. Think about a Jewish person for a moment. Think about my family. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How about Moses? God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. God gave Moses the law. He's part of my family. Do you know there's royalty in our veins? King David, Solomon, Jeremiah the prophet. Not royalty, but he's a prophet. How about Isaiah the prophet? My whole background just reads as a list of important, significant people. God made a covenant with us. God gave us scripture. He did, didn't he? What they would have viewed as the Old Testament scriptures. God uniquely blessed us. He gave us scripture. He did not speak to other people this way. Do you know any Philistines today? How about Ammonites? Moabites, Edomites, Cushites, Gergeshites, Jebusites. They're all in the Bible. Do you know any of those folks today? If you don't, do you? They're just gone. Interesting, there are still Jews today. In many ways, they have been a privileged people, to be sure. And I'm not trying to take away from that. Now, making application to our own day, I have had this conversation a couple of times over the years, and it's, it's made an imprint upon me. It's impressed me. I have had a young person come to me and say, when they learn that I'm a pastor, which the responses to that are always interesting, 
But one response I've received over the years is, oh, my granddad was a pastor. And there have been times when I've walked away from a conversation like that thinking, I wonder if that young person believes that some special merit accrues to his account because his granddad was a pastor. Why would I even think that? Well, because the conversation led my mind as it turned to think in some unhealthy way. It seems like this person thinks that because his granddad is a pastor, that that means he's closer to God or in a better relationship with God or God is more accepting of him because of some individual in his past. It's just really interesting. I've certainly encountered people who I do think have an unhealthy thinking process that I'm part of a church, I'm in membership in a church, I've been baptized in a church, I, I have a copy of the Bible, I partake of communion, therefore I must be right with God, I, I must be accepted by God. Now, going back to the grandson, you know what would be true of every godly grandfather who was a pastor? Without exception, this would be true of each and every one. Any godly grandfather who was a pastor, that godly grandfather recognized that he was a sinner saved by grace. A sinner saved by grace. The peril of your background, of your pedigree, of trusting in the wrong thing, of being confused with these important questions, who is God and how does he save? There's no more important questions, it seems to me, than those two. Who is God and how does he save? Back to verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast, in God. I think Paul means here boast in terms of your relationship with God. But notice these words. You call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law. Isn't that ironic? I think what Paul's saying here, you rely upon the law for your acceptance with God. You rely upon the law for your salvation with God. Why is that ironic? In the Old Testament, is it the purpose of the law to save people? No, it isn't. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, from the biblical perspective, from Genesis to Revelation, the law doesn't save anyone. In fact, Paul makes that very clear in chapter 3. It's the same page in my Bible, chapter 3, verse 20, where he says... By the way, when he, means, when he talks about the law, he means the Ten Commandments primarily. But really, the Old Testament law, it's the Ten Commandments apply to many situations. He says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Of course, in context, he means in God's sight. For by works of the law, no person will be justified or declared righteous in the sight of God because it is sensed through the law that knowledge of sin comes to us. In other words, we're lawbreakers. And one of the reasons God gives us the law is so that we will learn that we are lawbreakers. God is righteous. His law is righteous. We oftentimes are not righteous. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Years ago, I read the story of a pastor who had taken a two-year moratorium <coughs> on golf. How many of you play golf? A few of you? I played one time. That tells you something right there, doesn't it? Yeah, I did find a ball. I, I realized you're not supposed to pick up balls when you find them on the golf course. Didn't know that. <laughs> I found that out. Someone wasn't happy with me. I tried one time. It was not a 
pleasing experience. I probably should try it again. Well, this pastor was an avid golfer, but he took a two-year moratorium because he could not control his temper. Finally, after two years, we find him on the golf course at the 12th hole, and all of a sudden, he just is enraged. He grabs the golf clubs off the back of the cart, and with all of his strength, he hurls them into the lake. Then he begins to march off, and he looks over his shoulder, his golfing buddy, and he says, you will have to finish alone. Now his buddy got in the golf cart, turned it around, and drove it right next to the pastor. And he said, I can't finish alone. And the pastor barked out, why not? And he said, you just threw my golf clubs in the way. <laughs> Now, when you hear stories like that, or you talk to golfers, there is this frustration sometimes, because it's, the, it's this idea of falling short. It's not, I, I, I'm not coming up to the standard by which I should, in my own mind, I guess, come up to. Golf is pointing out to me my weakness. The law of God is meant to do the very same thing in our lives. It is meant to bring us to a place where we recognize that what the Bible says is true, for all have sinned. That means you have sinned and I have sinned. All of us together fall short of the glory and the approval of God. And so what I'm suggesting to you, in terms of Paul, I mean, imagine Paul confronting these Jewish, religiously lost individuals who think of themselves as being a cut above everyone else. They're proud of their heritage. And you can just see their, their chest is puffed up with pride. And Paul is sticking his finger right into that puffy chest and he's saying, you have misunderstood who God is. You've misunderstood the way of salvation. You have misunderstood your own scriptures in a fundamental way because you are relying upon the law for your salvation. You're boasting in your right relationship with God. And instead, you should be on your hands and knees confessing your sin, acknowledging your need for God's grace. Because at the end of the day, the law of God is meant to drive us to the foot of the cross of Christ. Verse 18. You know His will. You approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. Verse 19. And if you are sure that you are set yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Where do you think Paul got that language? One of the leading theories, and I think it's probably right, he's simply borrowing their own words. Again, he's unmasking how they really did think about themselves. I said before, Romans chapter 2 must have caught the religious Jewish individual really off guard. Because Romans chapter 1, the Jewish religious lost person would have been leading the Amen chorus. Preach it, brother, we agree. Those Gentiles, they are under the wrath of God, to be sure. They are wretches and they are lost. We really approve of this gospel you preach. And then Paul comes to Romans chapter 2, and like a sniper, he puts his sights right on the Jewish individual. And I think here he's probably using their own words against them. This is really what they thought. We are a guide to the blind. We are a light to those in darkness. We are the instructors of the foolish. We are the teachers of the children. 
We have the knowledge and we have the truth. In fact, I can imagine the Jewish reader or listener at this point becoming somewhat frustrated. It might be something like this. Paul, do you live in the real world? I mean, honestly, what synagogue do you belong to? Do you ever step outside of your synagogue? Paul, when is the last time you read the newspaper? Do you know what's going on in this world? Do you not recognize how dark and blind and foolish people in this world are? How lost they are? How dare you draw a moral comparison between dirty dog Gentiles and good religious law-abiding folk like us. You see why I said, Paul forfeits the Jewish clergyman of the year award with what he's saying in this text. But it's not hard to apply this to the church, is it? I mean, stop and think with me for a moment. How do you sometimes think? You don't want to acknowledge it, do you? Think about these words. Think about people in the world. It's true, isn't it? They are blind. They are living in darkness. They are foolish. They are like children spiritually lost. It's not hard at all to take verses like these verses and apply them directly to a group of people like us sitting in the four walls of this sanctuary at this moment. So verse 21 becomes almost like the punchline in all of this. You then, Paul writes, you then, can you imagine Paul sticking his finger in the puppy chest of a religious lost person? You then, who teach others. Oh yes, you know the Bible very well. Do you not teach yourself? You there, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? You there, who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? So what Paul here does is take us directly to the Ten Commandments. We preached through the Ten Commandments not that long ago, and when we did that, I talked about how each one of those commandments represents a category of sins. Usually the worst within that category is what is specifically mentioned in the Ten Commandments. So think about that. The Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not murder. That's a category which includes anger, the desire to murder. You don't actually take the knife and plunge in the chest, but you'd sure like to. So we should recognize that when Paul mentions the Ten Commandments, he's mentioning a whole host of sins. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never committed adultery, but you've had a heart full of lust. You've never committed adultery, but pornography is an issue in your life. Oh, you preach against others, but why not preach at yourself for a change? Well, I wouldn't steal. Well, you have a heart, though, that is covetous to the core. You don't steal because you don't want to get caught, but you sure like to steal. Or maybe you steal time from your boss. You preach against stealing, do you steal? You say you should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Do you have a heart that is adulterous? You who have four idols, oh the Jews, they were the monotheistic chosen ones, they hated all idolatry. Do you rob temples? Paul actually might mean something quite literal there. In other words, idolatrous temple worship is so obscene that if we were to steal something from a temple, we're already doing God's work. It might be kind of valuable, too. 
God would overlook this. Indeed, he'd praise us for that. You who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law over and over and over and over again. I'm not going to say anything more about those verses. I instead want to just make this basic point. I conclude from Paul's teaching that partial righteousness places a person in great peril. The peril of partial righteousness. I conclude from Paul's teaching that partial righteousness places a person in great peril. Perhaps more than anything else, this is what makes the religious lost truly lost. You understand what I'm saying? Partial righteousness. It's not righteousness that satisfies God, but it's a partial righteousness. In other words, I think it is very common for us to think this way. If we're honest, let me read these words. Yes, I sometimes sin, but I, so, I don't sin like other people do. Oh yes, I have broken God's law, but I'm not flagrant about it like other people are. Is this hitting a little bit close to home? Yeah. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, page 877. What a great story this is. This is Jesus, the storyteller, at his most brilliant self. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? <laughs> great storyteller. I mean, the parables of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, they just, they just have power to them. This is Jesus getting at the same thing that Paul is getting at in that epistle, but in the form of a story. Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. He also told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, Read that again. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That's what I'm calling a partial righteousness. <laughs> there are people that, from a human perspective, they actually do live a better life than folks in the world. Let's not deny that. They're partially righteous. But it's being partially righteous that makes them completely lost. Because they simply don't understand their need for God's grace. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and this always seems to be present in that sickness. They treated others with contempt. That's the religious Jewish lost person looking at the Gentile from the box seat saying, God judged them, they surely deserve this. So two such men, one is religiously lost, the other is irreligiously lost. The text says they went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now you know about Pharisees, don't you? In our culture, certainly in our church culture, the word Pharisee is a synonym for hypocrite. But that's not how the first century world thought. They did not have that negative understanding of the word Pharisee. When they read the word Pharisee or heard the word Pharisee, they thought supremely pious religious person. Churchgoer. Probably a Baptist in our context. And the tax collector. Well, we know about tax collectors, don't we? They were cheaters. They were Jews who were collaborators with Rome. They were like the IRS agent on steroids. There's the old story. I'm probably not going to get this right because it's not in my notes, but it's the IRS agent. And oh, let's not go there because I don't think I can get it right. 
Tax collectors were like prostitutes in the first century. That's, that's how they were thought of. Really low. The Pharisee, we read, was standing by himself, and he prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look at verse 14. Jesus declares judgment. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, who is altogether righteous. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do not leave this building today believing that a partial righteousness will save you with God. Do not leave this building today believing that partial righteousness is enough. Instead, leave this building today trusting in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. I'll close with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one, only, unique son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but will receive everlasting life. It is believing in Christ, trusting in Christ, resting in Christ's righteousness, purchased on the cross. That is the way that we are saved. And it is the only way that we will ever be saved. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for your glorious gospel as we continue to walk through the Advent season. May we rejoice exceedingly in it. May your gospel speak to us today. May we have great joy as we recognize that we are saved by your goodness and by your grace. That most famous verse reminds us that you are the God who gave Christ. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. Lord, I just pray that we will trust in you, in your grace, and in the righteousness of Christ freely gifted to us. May we dress ourselves in it. May we wrap ourselves up in it, recognizing that when we have the righteousness of Christ who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sins, that we are in a relationship with you whereby we have peace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close today by singing Amazing Grace. If you don't know Amazing Grace, it's written by a man who 